hear me? Yeah, all right. Um, yeah, so my name is Rolf Jagerman. I'm a PhD student at the University of Amsterdam. And today I'll be presenting Glint, an asynchronous parameter server for Spark. Uh, and this is work I've performed during my master thesis at uh, ETH Zurich um, at the Data Analytics Lab. So thanks to them for making this project possible. Um, so I'm going to start off with some motivation here. Um, this is a figure you've probably seen in some variations many times today. We have some data set. We have a machine learning algorithm that takes in this data and produces a model. And this model is typically in the form of a factor or a matrix um, that we can then use to make decisions. Now, in recent years, we've seen that the data side has really exploded, right? We have a lot more data now than we used to. And luckily, we have things like Spark to help us process this data in parallel and still do this same pipeline. But as a result of having more data, we can now also afford to learn more complex models that have more parameters. So not only did our data grow, but also our model size has grown. So we have bigger factors, bigger matrices that we are trying to learn and to infer. And there's a couple of areas where this has really become apparent. Um, one of them is deep learning, which is like a type of magic almost, where you'd have many hidden layers trying to learn some sort of decision function. They're all interconnected, and you need to learn all of these weights. Uh, and this just takes a lot of space. Uh, another area is factorization machines. So there was actually a talk today by Nick, who presented uh, Glint FM, which actually uses the Glint parameter server to do uh, factorization machines, where you try to model feature interactions. So uh, this also has an enormous dimensionality uh, where the model size is, is growing a lot. And finally, uh, this is where I'm mostly going to be focusing on in this talk, and that is topic modeling, and specifically LDA topic modeling. So in, in topic modeling, you have some collection of documents. These are just text documents, unstructured text. And you try to infer uh, certain topics that, uh, that exist within this, in this collection of documents. So here you have, for example, a topic about tourism with, with words like hotel and car, holiday, and whatever. Um, and this can also become quite large when you want to infer many topics. So you have to infer parameters that's of the size, um, size of, of your vocabulary multiplied by the number of topics. So this can become quite large when you have hundreds or even thousands of topics. Um, so why is this a problem? Well, it turns out that we nowadays have models that become so big that they don't even fit in a single machine. Right, so we have to distribute out these models. Um, so to show you this is a problem within Spark, uh, we have a very basic Spark setup here. We have uh, a driver at the top. We have several Spark workers. And the way we typically do any sort of machine learning in there is we take some model that we have at the top, so this model, and we have to broadcast this to all of our workers. And all of these workers will then do some sort of inference. They will slightly change uh, this model. So they will do some computation on their local data and uh, change the model. And then these models will have to be uh, reduced back together, typically aggregated through some sort of averaging process, uh, back to the driver. And then we have a new model for the next iteration. And we, we keep doing this. Um, but of course, if this model is very large, the problem is they won't fit in the Spark workers, and the communication cost of constantly reducing it back to the driver is, is very large, and this forms a bottleneck. So one way to solve this problem is something that's been proposed in the machine learning literature, is uh, using a parameter server. So when this was introduced, it was a complete machine learning framework, uh, where we take this machine learning model, we break it down into little parts, and we distribute it out to multiple machines. And then we basically have two very simple operations. We have a pool, which queries parts of our model. Uh, and this is a basic read operation, right? So this is very simple to implement. You just read whatever is in, in our matrix or in our factor, whatever. And then we have a push operation, which actually updates parts of the model. Now, this is like a write operation. And this is a bit more complicated uh, because, well, you may have many Spark workers writing to the same location. and this would require you to implement locking schemes or other complex things. 
Um, however, in, in the parameter server, uh, we exploit something that happens in a lot of machine learning, and it's the fact that update equations typically, not always, but typically take on a form where we have some parameter wi, and we update it by adding some delta into it. And this delta could be, uh, in the case of stochastic gradient descent, basically the gradient of your loss function. Or in the case of topic modeling, uh, if you had to do like collapse gift sampling, this delta would be plus one or minus one depending on the output of your sampler. Um, and we can use this fact by basically saying we only aggregate push updates uh, via addition. Right? So addition is very simple to implement. It's commutative and it's associative, so the order in which we apply these updates doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about locking schemes. We completely avoid uh, that problem. So uh, I've implemented Glint, which is a parameter server implementation that works nicely with Spark. Uh, so to show you how it works, we're going to go back to the same image. And we have, again, a Spark driver. We have several Spark workers. But now we also have parameter servers running. And we can take a machine learning model. We can break it down into smaller parts and distribute this out to these parameter servers. And then our workers can pull parts of this model. Right? So they can uh, grab only small parts of this model. And then they can perform some sort of computation on it. And then once it finishes, it can push its updates, its changed model, back to the parameter servers. Uh, so something like this. Now, uh, Glint is designed to be fully asynchronous. So all the pull and push requests happen asynchronously. And you can do all of them at the same time. So you can pull, you can push, you can do computation uh, simultaneously. So going back to this situation, it looks something like this, where we have simultaneous pulls and pushes while computation is going on. Um, so this is a very high-level overview of uh, the parameter server, and specifically Glint. Uh, now I'm going to show you a quick code demo to show you how this actually works in practice and how we would uh, use this library. All right, so what I have here is just a regular Spark shell. And what you'll notice at the top is that I've loaded in uh, a jar file. So this is the, the Glint library. And that's all we've done. We didn't change the cluster. This runs on any Spark cluster you want. That's all we had to do. And now, um, to use this, I'm first going to do some very basic uh, Spark stuff. So I'm going to import mlutils, because we want to load a data set, for example. Right? So this is regular Spark uh, stuff. Um, here I'm going to load some sample data. So these are sparse vectors, about 100 of them. and um, they're relatively small because I'm running this entire demo on my local host machine. Uh, but of course, in practice, the point is that you can scale this up uh, much further. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you the feature size of, of these vectors. So what's the dimensionality? And you'll see that it's very small. It's only 692. Again, the point is to really scale this up to hundreds of millions, but you'd need a cluster to really do that. So for the purposes of this demo, I'm just showing you how the code works and not uh, the scalability. So here is where we start to really deviate from default uh, Spark stuff. So we're going to import the library, um, and specifically the client. And now we can run a line of code which will uh, run uh, the parameter servers on our Spark cluster. So we provide SC, that's our Spark context, and uh, an address where to run it. Um, and what it will do is we will construct this client and spawn parameter servers on all of our Spark workers. And this client object that we get back is essentially our interface uh, to these values. So what can we do? We can construct now a distributed vector or matrix on these parameter servers. And the way we do that is we simply call uh, this vector method. And it's parameterized by a type. So in this case, we want a double. But you can also do things like integers, longs, floats, uh, and any numeric type will work. And we specify our feature size. So this is going to be a vector with 692 dimensions, and it's going to be distributed out over our uh, parameter servers. So um, this constructs uh, an object called big vector of type double. Uh, and this big vector object is not actually storing any data. It's just an interface for us to communicate with the parameter servers where the data is actually uh, kept. So what I can do now is um, show you some of the methods in this vector. So we see this very simple interface. Um, 
most notably, there we have the pull and the push uh, methods. So these are the ones that you'd expect um, out of the distributed factor. Now, before we can actually use these things, we need to note that these are asynchronous, and they need to run in something called an execution context. So that's what I just created. This is a very default Scala concurrency thing. Uh, it's like an abstraction of a thread pool, and you can really play around with this. Uh, I'm, right now, I'm using implicit.global. This is the default fork join thread pool, but you can really try all kinds of things, like cache thread pools, fixed thread pools, uh, all kinds of things. Um, so moving on, now that we have this defined, we can um, pull stuff from our factor. Right? So we can say factor.pull, and we just specify the indices that we're interested in. So we say, give me whatever's at the factor at index 100, 300, and 500. And when we execute this, we'll note that what we get back is actually not a result, but it's something called a future. And this is like a placeholder for some eventual value uh, that we're going to get. So how would we use this? Um, well, we can attach, we can wait for it, but we can also attach callbacks to it. So in this case, we're doing the same thing. We're going to pull index 100, 300, and 500, and we're attaching an on success callback. So when this request actually completes, it will execute whatever is in, in the brackets. So in this case, we're just going to print out the values. So when we run this, um, we should see a bunch of values, and they're all zero. So when we initialize a factor uh, in the system, it's by default initialized to be all zero. Now, I could show you how to push data as well, but that's not really interesting, and I assume you'd, you'd get it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this data set that we loaded earlier and uh, run some code on it. So, All right, so uh, what we are going to do is what's called an all-reduce operation. We're basically going to take all of our sparse factors that we have in our RDD data set, and we're going to add them all together into a single factor. This is essentially all we're doing. Um, so we're using our RDD that we loaded earlier. We're running a for each. This is a Spark for each. So all of this within the closure will be executed on Spark workers. Um, and we're just going to take each sample in our data set. We're going to extract the indices and the values that are the non-zero indices and values of our sparse vector. And then um, we're going to push those to our distributed vector. So we're going to add those in there. And um, we, again, need to define this execution context because this is running on Spark workers and they don't have access to whatever I provided in the, in the shell earlier. So when I actually run this, it should be pretty quick. So Spark starts to run and it's done, right? It's pretty fast. And to show you that it actually uh, worked, I'm just going to pull, again, uh, the values at index 100, 300, and 500 and show you that they actually changed um, to different values. So the main takeaway here is that we have this sort of distributed factor, distributed matrix, and it is safe to be used within Spark closures. So you can construct it and just use it however you like. Um, so that concludes the demo. Uh, going back to the slides. All right. Um, so that's a very simple example of how to use Glint to do uh, distributed uh, factors or matrices. Um, now I'm going to show you some experiments that we've performed. Um, and in this case, our task was to implement LDA topic modeling using this parameter server approach uh, with 1,000 topics on 27 terabytes of data. So this is the Clue Web 12 data set. It's a data set that's used in academia for uh, all kinds of web-related research. So these contain random web pages that were crawled. Um, and we had to do this on a setup where we only have 30 Spark workers with 16 CPU cores each. So in industry, this is, this is really small, right? Because it's not much, but in academic world, we, we don't have much resources. So um, this is what we work with. And we have 3.7 terabytes of RAM in total. And all these nodes are interconnected over 10 gigabit per second Ethernet. So our approach is that we use Glint to store our model, to store our topic model. And it has billions of parameters because we use 1,000 topics. Um, now, in order to get uh, it to run in a feasible amount of time, we use an LDA approximation algorithm. I'm not going to go into detail what this exactly is. You can ask me afterwards. Um, that would be a talk in and of itself. Um, but because it's a sort of approximation, uh, we have to realize that uh, we may lose some model quality. 
So a small loss is in this case acceptable because we are able to scale much further than we could with other methods. So, um, and we're going to compare three methods. So we're going to compare uh, the Glint-based implementation against the two implementations that exist in MLLib. So we have this EM approach and the online approach. Now, the first thing I want to show you is perplexity. So perplexity is a measure that is sort of like an indicator of how good the topic model is that it computes. And um, we ran this on, on different subsets of the data with a different amount of topics. So here we have uh, data going from 50 gigabytes, 100, 150, 200, all at 20 topics. And then we start increasing the number of topics. So we go from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80. Now, the exact numbers for the perplexity are not that interesting, especially if you're not familiar with that metric. And what's more interesting is how EM and the online approach is compared to it. So uh, on the first line, you see that the EM has a minus 1.3%. This means that the EM algorithm actually produced a topic model that was of worse quality. So it was 1.3% worse than what our approach computed. And the online method was plus 0.4%, so it was slightly better than our approach. And we see there's quite some variance here. Um, and we see specifically that when we start to increase the number of topics, the EM algorithm actually performs quite well uh, and produces a topic model. But again, we're using an approximation algorithm, so this, this, this loss in quality is, in many cases, uh, acceptable. So what I want to show you next is basically the same thing, but now we're looking at the runtime. So how long does our algorithm run compared to the other two? And we see that our performance is much, much better than uh, what we could get with EM, and specifically with the online method. So it turns out as you increase the number of topics with the online uh, approach, uh, it really starts to explode in runtime. So that's kind of unfeasible. And the EM algorithm seems to keep up quite well. It's still slower, but it's, it seems to scale quite nicely, um, which brings me to the next, which is shuffle write. So we all know in Spark, we want to avoid shuffle writes. Um, they're bad. So the online approach and the Glint approach do not generate a shuffle write in the algorithm, so that's very nice. Um, but the EM algorithm does. And especially when you start increasing the number of topics, uh, we see that this, this shuffle write grows linearly with the number of topics. When you try to increase it even further, you eventually reach some sort of bottleneck where um, you won't have output locations for your shuffle write and everything starts going really bad. Now, I, I use here the amount of data going from 50 uh, to 200 gigabytes of data, and even though we have 27 terabytes of data available. So why is this? Well, when we try to scale MLLib on our cluster beyond 200 gigabytes or 100 topics, we get all kinds of task and job failures. So eventually we run into out of memory issues, uh, we run into issues with uh, no output locations for shuffles, uh, all kinds of problems. Um, however, with our approach, we were able to compute a topic model on the full 27 terabytes of data uh, with 1,000 topics. And here we plotted the perplexity as it is training, so we see that it converges quite smoothly uh, to perplexity of around, I believe it was around 5,000. So this is quite an acceptable uh, uh, result. And actually to run this on, on our small cluster in, in just 70 to 80 hours is, is really good because um, it's, it's really a lot of data uh, that we're processing. So, to conclude this talk, I've introduced uh, Glint. It's an asynchronous parameter server for Spark. It allows us to do machine learning uh, for very large models. Um, its asynchronous design enables us to use highly flexible threading mechanisms, so we can experiment with this execution context and really explore uh, the realm of multi-threading there. It is extremely easy to use. I've shown you in the code demo that it's it uh, just takes a few lines of code, and you're already up and running, and it's, it's working. And then, um, finally, I've shown you that it outperforms uh, MLLib specifically on the task of LDA topic modeling. So that's, uh, that's a very promising and, and good result. So um, now there's still some future work. So one of the things we're working on is better fault tolerance. So right now, if one of the parameter servers dies, you lose that part of the model. Um, and this, depending on your algorithm, can be really bad or acceptable. Um, but it would be nice to have a fault tolerance. And the way to do this is by using a court-like DHT structure. So this is a distributed hash table. And there have been parameter server implementations that can successfully do this. Um, another part of future work is to have user-defined functions for aggregation. So right now I mentioned that we're 
aggregating all of our push updates via addition, um, because it has certain nice properties and it works for a lot of machine learning problems. But there may be other functions that, that may be more appropriate depending on what you're exactly doing. Uh, another point is support for sparse models. So right now we store our models in a dense format, so all these matrices and factors are dense. Uh, this is typically not a problem because you're distributing it out over many machines anyway, so you have access to a lot of memory. But uh, to scale even further and, and go beyond uh, thousands of topics to even higher numbers, uh, sparse models are definitely the way to go. And finally, we want to implement other algorithms. So things like deep learning or uh, GLMs, linear models, um, we want to see can this parameter server implementation really provide what's necessary to scale these uh, machine learning algorithms up. So the source code is available on GitHub. We also have an issue tracker where we um, where we accept any form of feedback, comments, questions. Uh, we accept contributions, so uh, feel free to check it out. I really encourage you to do so. And uh, thank you. OK, so I think there is uh, time for questions, Plenty. Yeah. And more uh, up-to-date uh, cyclides, cyclade, I guess, pronounced the English way. Um, Hogwild is basically a uh, NSGD um, concurrent update model where you are completely log-free. Uh, it has been implemented originally as a cache access for a processor, where you would be hitting the same, the same machine, but the principle is the same. The idea is that the updates that you're going to make to your parameter server, in the case of SCD, are massively sparse. Nobody is going to try to hit the same location uh, in, in the same way. Mm -hmm. And then CCLAD is further work looking at when conflicts occur, how do you detect them, how do you detect typical conflicts occurring from the same couple of workers, and how do you resolve the conflict graph. And it get, got even more performance out of that. And that would be directly applicable as an update or as a, as a module to um, Glint. Yeah, I haven't looked into Hawkwild or these types of implementations. Um, we specifically designed Glint originally for topic modeling, and specifically collapse skip sampling. So that is just plus one, minus one. It's very simple update equations. Um, but that would be interesting to, to look into, uh, but we haven't done so so far. Our focus was also really to make this very compatible with Spark, so to make it run very smoothly and easily within the Spark ecosystem. Uh, so that was one of our main goals, yeah. Uh, great talk, Rolf. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with regards to the distributed hash table, I, I was wondering, um, does that mean you're going to run like a peer-to-peer -peer network on the Spark workers, or would that be a peer-to-peer -peer network outside of the Spark cluster? Um, so that would run within the Spark workers. So they would, just as I've shown you right now, where I run these parameter servers on our uh, Spark workers, uh, it would function in the same way. So we'd, we'd run uh, essentially like a court-like DHS. It's not exactly peer-to-peer. -peer. It's sort of there was some coordination at the central level. Um, but yeah, the main point is that we can replicate the model then in sort of this ring-like structure and then have some sort of fault tolerance with that. But it would run within, within Spark, yeah. Uh, I have a question about the implementation of LDA. Mm -hmm. Do you have an implementation that is completely separate? Do you have a code base that is open source? Uh, yeah, the code for the LDA is also open source. It's uh, the same link except put LDA at the end, so Glint LDA, and then you'll find the source code there. Um, Thank you. Another question was, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, the online version of LDA mm -hmm. did not have any shuffle, but what is then the main difference between your implementation and that online version? Because you, you mentioned as well that you couldn't scale the online version. Mm -hmm. and I was thinking, oh, that is a shuffle problem, but it looks like it's not a shuffle problem. So wh why is uh, your implementation scalable and the online version is not scalable? Yeah, so in, in the online version, what's actually happening, you take the full topic model, you distribute it out to all of these workers, and then you do some sort of small local computation to change it slightly, and then you reduce it back together. That's what's happening in, in the online method. So when you increase the number of topics, the amount of data that you have to broadcast and, and reduce back together 
uh, grows, right? So that's the main issue with scaling up a number of topics in that approach is that as your model gets larger, it gets larger multiplied by the number of workers because each one has to, to do this. So that's the main reason why we see big uh, performance degradations there. Hey, uh, great talk, by the way. Thanks. Um, first, just a question on uh, something I may have missed there. Is there any locking between updates across machines? I don't think there is from what you said. Is that correct? Uh, what, what do you mean? Sorry. Uh, so they're asynchronous between the machines, right? So yeah. two machines could update the same location, and yeah. there could be yeah. a conflict. So in that sense, maybe uh, the previous comment about uh, trying out Hogwild, uh, I, I think maybe that's sort of what is there currently. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the second uh, question I had, and this is maybe a little bit of an ignorant <laughs> question, is I've never quite understood what the benefits are of a parameter server type approach over mm, maybe something very simple like just using memcache to hold the parameters. Is there something kind of specific over and above that? Yeah, so over like basic distributed key value stores, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, so in, in, in the Basic key value stores, uh, you do have to worry about this locking uh, problem. So um, the way we designed this is to really focus purely on the machine learning application that we had in mind, collapse skip sampling. Um, and avoiding locks is really uh, a good way to improve performance. Right? So if you try to do locks, you typically are going to get severe performance degradations. Um, it kind of depends on, on the implementation of your algorithm, of course, but yeah. yeah. Anyone else? Okay, I think we're done. Please uh, join us downstairs in the expo hall for uh, reception, which means free food and drink. Okay. And thank, thank you. you.